And I am a fan of nutrient timing for most athletes, which is the energy phase, anabolic phase, and growth phase. In other words, you're consuming while you're working out, while your muscles are you know, firing, you're getting a glucose electrolyte solution. And I do like brand chains and glutamine with that. So you're actually almost recovering as you're training. And we know that delays central fatigue, those muscles can work harder. Beta alanine helps a lot with that as well. So the energy phase, fuel the muscle. Now, of course, even before that, there's pre-exercise. You'd be surprised how many top athletes, they show up to work out, Monday morning when I was with the Jets, I didn't even eat. So their cortisol levels are through the roof. It's, it's ridiculous. They're just torching muscle. So we start with a pre-exercise snack. Then we got the energy phase. Then teach them the anabolic phase. And what we did when I was at the Jets is I determined each, each player, what their goal was with their weight and lean body mass, I would come up with a one to one ratio, two to one ratio, three to one ratio, or four to one ratio, carb to protein based on the goal of that particular player. Hey folks, it's Mike Mutzel here with HighIntensityHealth.com. Thanks so much for tuning in to episode number 104 with Dr. Tom Balila. We're going to talk about ketogenic diets, his Transformation 360 program, which uh, he's incorporated and, and built this thing over the last 25 years of being a chiropractic physician uh, and working with a lot of high-end athletes, many of the New York Jets, uh, New York Giants, uh, athletes from the Chicago Bears, and much more have sought Dr. Tom out because he has a grasp on helping people improve their body composition, lose weight build muscle and burn fat. So we're excited to have him on. So Dr. Tom, thanks for being here. Hey, I'm really super excited. I just want to say the last time I saw you, Michael, was you were upside down on your head in the gym at the IFM conference at the hotel. <laughs> so it was pretty impressive. Um, you, you definitely walk the walk, talk the talk. You're working out, then you're upside down in your head, and then you're like in a mantra chant. So um, what you say you do on your on, on, on high intensity health, you really do. So I want to acknowledge you for that. And you got more muscle in real life than people realize. So I just want to let you know your lean body mass is fantastic. I love it. Yeah, that was great. And I had the foam roller. And if I recall, you were practicing what you preach and you were getting into your hips and abs and low back because we were doing a lot of sitting. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, these 50 year old glutes need some help once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, let's kind of talk about how you got into chiropractic and then bodybuilding, Dr. Tom. And I just want to let everyone know that uh, you are Mr. or formerly Mr. New Jersey, a uh, natural uh, bodybuilder. Yeah. You want to kind of talk about that and your role and how you got into uh, fitness? It's my favorite topic, actually, Michael. Thank you. No, 1995, Mr. South Jersey, all natural. I did one bodybuilding show. It was a one hit wonder because I really wanted to apply the principles I've been learning in nutrition um, and kind of just said, let me do a show. Let me put it all out there. And I did it. And that comes back from like 1994. And I was working with a company EAS when Bill Phillips and Sean Phillips were moving that company. I was like their main ambassador. So I started on their products back in the day and creatine. If you remember those days, you're kind of young, but then just applied the principles of proper supplementation, but mainly proper food and macronutrient ratios. I said, let me apply it to myself. I had the old RGL body composition machine back then, the bioelectric was still around, and would do body comps. I said, I'm going to do the bodybuilding show. Next thing you know, um, I got a couple trophies, and I said, that's the most difficult thing I've ever done, but it taught me a lot about nutrition, about self-discipline, and it kind of really forged part of my career. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. I'll uh, post for those of you listening to this uh, through iTunes or Stitcher. Uh, if you go to highintensityhealth.com slash DR Tom, I'll have this video. And then also the video of that, uh, that when you were in contest ready shape and you had Whoa. striations everywhere, you were very lean. And so what I wanted to kind of talk to you about, were you doing a ketogenic diet at that point? I know that's kind of a big part of your practice. Now, maybe let's talk about dietary strategies that were able to get you that lean. Yeah. So back then, you know, I was 30. I was definitely using a very sophisticated macronutrient program. I learned a lot of that from Keith Klein back in the day. He's in Texas. Um, but basically, I was um, manipulating my protein carb fat ratios. I was probably at about 35, 40 percent protein. Um, actually, it's about 40 percent protein, 40 percent carbs, 20 percent fat. I'm going to manipulate the calories. Um, so I was at a decent amount of protein carbs then and the calories were pretty high, had a pretty fast metabolism. As I get older, you know, now um, impact carbohydrates, you know, I keep those to a minimum and um, I don't do a key. I do a ketogenic program myself about every three months. I feel better doing it. I lean out beautifully. That belly fat shrinks. And we certainly use as one element of my practice here in Nutrition Treatment Center, we have a um, division of my practice, which is a five-week ketogenic program. Mm -hmm. Now, when you said you do the ketogenic diet every 90 days, was it? What, what does that look like? You go on it for a couple weeks and come yeah, off? I usually do it for about um, two or three weeks. 
It all depends on how, you know, I get to my target weight. And at that point, I'm like, okay, that's great. Or I know I have a social event. I'm like, okay, I got a wedding or I got, you know, a nice weekend. So, you know, I'll just do that on occasion. You know, we our program is five weeks, but we tell people if you hit your goal weight before then, then you stop. But um, all the research is pretty clear, you know, keto clarity and all the benefits of keto diet. So I think for um, a certain amount of people, it's, it's the right approach to induce fat loss for sure and get them to adapt to fat burning. Um, it's a great tool to have in your practice. That's awesome. Fantastic. Yeah. So uh, we'll kind of explore ketosis in a little bit further. I have some other questions there. But first, I just want to know, how did you get into working with the New York Jets and being the lead nutritionist for them and like yeah. working with high-end athletes? So 2009, 2010, I was their team nutritionist. It was an interesting story. Um, Joe DeFranco, he's a big time trainer. He, uh, he works with uh, Triple H and he's worked with a lot of top athletes. He's in New Jersey here as well. Back in like 2003, Johnny Valentin, the baseball player, he was with the Red Sox and the Mets. He's local. He had a massage therapist and he kept saying, I need a nutritionist. I need a chiropractor. And Audra at the time was like, well, you, Dr. Tom's the only guy I know. I was doing a ART, doing the nutrition and training. So he came to me. He had some issues with his legs. I said, you know, I'm a washed, I'm a bodybuilder. I can put on lean body mass, but as far as like functional muscle and performance, you need to see Joe DeFranco. So I took him to see Joe DeFranco up in North Jersey. And that's where it all started. And then Joe DeFranco became really big, sought after by many NFL athletes and college guys. And then he would cross refer to me for the guys who were really serious. I've been working with guys like Brian Cushion since he was a sophomore at USC. David Deal came to see me his second year in the season as a giant, and he had a terrific career. So um, I started working with these athletes, and there was this guy by the name of, believe it or not, Sal Alosi, who is all over the media sometimes, and that's a whole nother story, but one of the greatest guys you'll ever meet. Sal Alosi was a friend and disciple of Joe DeFranco. DeFranco spoke about me. Alosi gets the job at the Jets in like 2008. I don't even know he gets a job with the Jets. One of my clients is sitting here going, did you know that the Jets were interviewing nutritionists? I said, I had no idea. Sal didn't even call me, sent my resume. Next thing you know, I'm at the facility interviewing. I get the job and then Sal's there. And then we connected. We changed the whole program around, introduced nutrient timing, macronutrients, got all organic foods in there ripped out the soda machines, ripped out the ice cream machines. Um, some, some of the athletes hated it too bad and not sure if it was a coincidence, but in 2009, 2010, they went to the AFC championship game and that's a fact. And then there was other considerations that, um, then Sal left and then I left because of Sal left and, and, uh, here we are now, but I work with a lot of athletes and I still do personal consulting to some of the top athletes out there, some top wrestlers, um, at the collegiate level and certainly at the high school level. Oh, that's fantastic. I remember that, uh, watching Rex Ryan, I think Mark Sanchez was still a quarterback back then and uh, the jets were rocking. I mean, they were really yeah. doing well. So that's, that's good yeah. to know that you were working with them during that time. So, yeah. um, you know, for athletes, maybe let's kind of split apart because we have a lot of people, you know, that listen to the show from weekend warriors to people that are pretty physically fit. And were you the, the carb timing and meal timing that you were you know, speaking about? Maybe let's dive into more detail. So someone who's really active, like an athlete, yeah. crossfitter or football player, how is their diet different from someone who just wants to lose weight? Like talk to us right. about that. Yeah. So of course, you know, one of the biggest mistakes athletes make, believe it or not, especially at that level with football is they're not meeting their caloric needs. They are not getting enough calories. And I see a lot of young athletes, high school, college, and they want to put on lean body mass. And I do a lot of education. The first thing I teach them most, in most cases, the number one key to putting on muscle is consuming more calories a day than you burn. Most people, athletes who want to increase lean body mass are not doing that. Then, of course, the second consideration is nutrient timing calorically. And I am a fan of nutrient timing for most athletes, which is the energy phase, anabolic phase, and growth phase. In other words, you're consuming while you're working out, while your muscles are you know, firing, you're getting a glucose electrolyte solution. And I do like brand chains and glutamine with that. So you're actually almost recovering as you're training. And we know that delays central fatigue. Those muscles can work harder. Beta alanine helps a lot with that as well. So the energy phase, fuel the muscle. Now, of course, even before that, there's pre-exercise. You'd be surprised how many top athletes, they show up to work out Monday morning when I was with the Jets, I didn't even eat. So their cortisol levels are through the roof. It's, it's ridiculous. They're just torching muscle. So we start with the pre-exercise snack. Then we got the energy phase. Then teach them the anabolic phase. And what we did when I was at the Jets is I determined 
each each player what their goal was with their weight and lean body mass, I would come up with a one to one ratio, two to one ratio, three to one ratio, or four to one ratio, carb to protein based on the goal of that particular player. And this is where I work closely with the strength coach, and it really was effective. But believe it or not, even a couple, we would actually have their shakes after the workout in the freezer refrigerator with their number on it. Half a third now, about four or five guys wouldn't even drink it. So sometimes compliance was an issue, but really to answer your question, big fan of nutrient timing, energy phase, anabolic phase, that critical window where you want to spike your insulin, reduce cortisol, right? Drive your protein, drive your carbs into your muscle. And then there's the growth phase, which is from workout to workout. And that's where macronutrient timing is very important. And everybody's different with respect to lean body mass, your age, et cetera. So that's really how I worked with the top athletes. And then I did myself back in the day when I was bodybuilding. That's fantastic. So you broke it down like uh, on the carb ratios, like one to one, two to one, three to one, four to one. So people that are pretty lean that need to put on weight, you'll go higher carbs uh, post-workout. Is that what we're saying? Precisely. Yeah. If they, if they're like, you know, um, fast oxidizer, fast metabolizer, you know, they're, they're long and lean, you know, you have that six foot two wide receivers, only 182 pounds. They need weight. Um, they usually need that four to one ratio. Um, sometimes a three to one ratio, but you, you nailed it. Bottom line is that get that insulin spike. You have someone who carb sensitive, insulin resistance, some of these offensive linemen are 320 pounds. They got to get to 305. I'm not going to spike their carbs too high post-workout. <laughs> right. no, they, right. they get a one-to-one ratio if they're lucky. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I know uh, Charles Poliquin has said that for a long time. He said, if you're fat, and he talks, he refers to like men being uh, fat above 10% body weight. And for women, I think it's above 15. He said, if you're fat, meaning in his ranges, you shouldn't have carbs after you work out because you really need to burn the fat. So that's interesting how you brought that down. Now, um, now that you're really involved in functional medicine as well, um, you know, in the retail space, there's all the dextrose and maltodextrin and different, you know, high glycemic uh, carbohydrates to have in the post-workout state, like you said, to cause that anabolic window to be maximal. Yeah. Um, are you recommending now fruit? I mean, can we do smoothies? Like talk to us about the different types of yeah. carbs. That, that's a good question. I think, you know, I don't think there's any ma- like dextrose, your sugar. I'm using a product now that where it's got a built in four to one ratio. It uses crystalline fructose and, and glucose polymers. But, you know, you can certainly use fruit juice. You know, the, uh, the other component of that, some people are fructose sensitive, right? Now, the young athlete, the 19 year old, they probably don't have a lot of sensitivities. They can probably handle those carbs. So I'm not sure if there is a magic sugar. I am a fan um, lately of some of the more slow releasing carbohydrates out there, the super starch, okay, for some athletes do well with that or the regular person who's looking for recovery. But bottom line is that you want to get that three to one, four to one ratio for that hard gainer. You can use a dextrose, you can use sugar, you can use juice, get a high quality protein, use your whey protein isolate is, is best because it's got the quickest release. If you tolerate whey protein, if you do plant protein, that's fine too. But the whey protein has the highest percentage of leucine and branch chains and glutamine. So it's usually best for recovery. So, so that's my answer. No, bottom line, something is better than nothing, but make sure that window within 30 minutes post-workout, you're getting that in your system. Mm, that's a great point. There's so many people, as you know, Dr. Tom, that after they work out, they're not hungry. They go to Starbucks, they get a frappuccino or a cappuccino or what have you. And it totally, you know, uh, catabolizes their, their lean gain. Yeah. You got to, you got to quench that cortisol, man. You're working out, your cortisol's high. You can spike the insulin, quench the cortisol. And insulin, as we well know, is the number one most anabolic hormone in the body. Right. So if you're looking at, you know, this is for people who want to increase lean body mass, get that insulin spike. If you're looking to burn fat, we're going to have a different conversation. Yeah. All right. Well, let's talk about that in a second. But uh, one last question that comes to mind, I get a lot of emails on this. It's for women that want to uh, build muscle and yeah. they're having a hard time doing that. You know, the, we're talking between ages 35 and 50, they're eating well, they're lean, but they're not putting on the muscle that they're looking to put on. So how would this program change for women? Yeah, that's a good question. So first and foremost, looking at their calories, making sure they're getting enough protein. I do body comp analysis here. I'm going to look at their lean body mass. If a woman is 125 pounds, let's say 100 pounds of lean body mass, she wants more muscle. Hey, she may need 1.25 to 1.5 grams of protein per pound of lean body mass. So she might not be getting 125 to 150 grams of protein pulse through the day. So that's the first consideration. Second consideration is again, you know, make sure those carbs are clean, making sure they're training appropriately. Oftentimes people who want to put on lean body mass, they're doing way too many sets, way too many reps, and they're not having a really a good cadence 
um, they're not going slow enough, say, time of tension with the muscle. So I am a big fan. I'm a little bit of a disciple of slow training, Mike Menser, and I do recommend for a lot of my clients a 444 program. Four sets per body part, four work sets, four second concentric, four second eccentric. Okay, that's really important. So sometimes you have to change the way you're training, put more time attention on the muscle. And just as important, are you getting enough time from workout to workout for full recovery? Each muscle group requires a certain amount of time for recovery. Like your quads, they may take six to seven days to fully recover. Oftentimes, oh, my legs are my legs are weak. My legs need muscle. So they're going to train them twice or three times a week. You're doing the opposite of what you should be doing. Where buys and tries, they can recover in as little as 48 hours. So you can sometimes train your buys and tries two to three days a week. So we look into, a, you know, this is called like a variable split training program. This is Dr. Fred Hatfield way back in the day looking at recovery for different body parts. Then we get into, okay, are you meeting your protein needs? And oftentimes they're restricting their carbs too much. So calories, you know, timing of your training, rest and recovery. Don't forget the benefit of creatine for women. If you're really saying, I want to put on muscle, listen, high quality creatine, you should put that into the mix. So there's a lot of components of that. And, um, you know, that's what I do. And I do have some clients, some women clients who want to put on muscle for sure. They want to, they want to look their best from a muscle standpoint. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's kind of neat. Muscles back. It's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Strong is the new skinny, right? Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I mean, I've, I've been into muscle my whole life. I, I, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger and I don't know if you remember Jean-Claude Van Damme and all those movies. I mean, I, I oh, idolize that, that body type. Um, so that's fantastic tips. Now let's, we haven't talked about time under tension and eccentric versus concentric. And I know you went into it in a little bit. Talk to us about why time under tension is important and maybe what that is. Good. So time under tension, man, it's where you're just really isolating that muscle. We do know that you're actually, can you see my muscle? It's, I can see it, baby. Looking it's good. Okay. It's okay. Okay. You're going to actually break down more muscle fibers on an eccentric than a concentric, okay? So what happens is most people who are training are actually just using a lot of momentum to actually accomplish that repetition, where when you do a cadence of four seconds, four seconds down and four seconds up, and you're not locking at the top and you're not locking and relaxing at the bottom, you're keeping pure tension on the muscle. There's a neurological recruitment there and actually going to probably recruit more muscle spindles. So the point is, is that slow and controlled, there's a lot of research that actually points at this being a very effective way to break down more muscle tissue. When you break down more muscle tissue and feed it, you're going to get a better anabolic response known as hypertrophy. And that's just the bottom line. It doesn't mean you're building functional muscle right now. Okay. And there's some people who are like, you know, into more of functional training. This, this is different. This is for putting on lean body mass. But once you put on the lean body mass, then you can make it functional. Mm -hmm. Right. So you can go through different kinds of stages of your training through the year um, with respect to what you need to do. And then I do body comp testing on everyone so we can gauge your muscle. We can look at symmetry. So time under tension is, I, I think, underappreciated for sure. Yeah. No doubt about it. That's a good point. Now let's, let's talk about this. So uh, the functional training is pretty big and hot right now with CrossFit and people doing box jumps and all these different things. And, and so I think what your training is more focused on hypertrophy training. Do you do a, a hybrid model or recommend that? Like what's overall yeah. best for health? Well, that's a good question. I individualize everything. You know, me personally, I actually spend about 35% of my training now, like probably stretching, <laughs> foam rolling, doing some cardio, and I'm probably working with weights two to three times a week for 20, 30 minutes. So the bottom line, and there's, there's no perfect workout, there's no perfect exercise, there's no perfect food, no. You have to look at the person and, and gauge what they need. You know, I call level one, two, and three fitness people when they come to my office as a client. Level one, man, they, they can't do much. They have postural faults. Um, they need to work on their balance and their flexibility and maybe very, you know, we start with very easy exercises with them. But the point is, is that I think that you should be dynamic in your training. Everything is important. But if you have someone who is sarcopenic, if you have a guy who's losing muscle or a woman is losing muscle, I don't think they need to be jumping up and down on a box or flipping a tire. Okay, that's not going to happen in the real world where it's okay, okay here it is. You've got to flip this tire to survive. Uh -uh. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, you, you know what happens? The squeeze is not, the juice is not worth the squeeze you know, with respect to exercise. But if you can go slow and controlled with a dumbbell um, and you can do it with a squat, you can do it with a leg press, you're going to, re you know, you're using less weight, you're reducing the, sh the, the friction and the, the joint stress, and you're activating muscle fibers. And that's how you get that response, a hyper, uh, you know, hypertrophy response. 
Mm, love it. Great advice. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's talk about periodization, like switching up the program. So you mentioned that, you know, four sets per major muscle group, and then the tempo of four, 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 which is concentric versus eccentric and so forth. Um, some people, the, the reason why I want to ask this question is some people go to the gym and they do a new exercise every time. And I don't know if that enables the body enough time to adapt and then cause the muscles to break down and get those neuromuscular networks. So for right. someone listening that wants to, you know, put on muscle and maintain a lean physique and, you know, fight uh, fat gain and all that with aging, how long should they stay in a program before they start switching up tempo and different exercises? Good. So I think, let's say someone wants to do 444 to increase lean body mass. I think 12 weeks is a good period of time to really do that. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to do the same exercise for chest each time. You know, you might do two sets of dumbbell press, two sets of flies, but make that dynamic and make that variable. Next time, maybe do some different type of chest exercise. Or when I was, you know, training and I would hit a, um, a plateau with weight, I was into bench pressing. If you hit a plateau at bench pressing, then maybe don't bench for a couple of weeks, do something else or change up the bench press type. Then maybe doing dumbbells or the bottom line is that you got to continue to make it variable for your body's nervous system and muscular adaptation system. So bottom line, I think 12 weeks is a good amount of uh, time to see changes. Now, if you're my client, we'll know you're getting results because I'll do the body comp on you and we'll see where you're currently at. And we do basic stuff to assess fitness. I have everywhere a heart rate monitor. All my clients, I recommend they get a heart rate monitor. They train in the proper zone for fat burning. So we get pretty darn specific and personalized with their program here at Nutrition Treatment Center, whether it be their cardio, their flexibility, um, and certainly do incorporating a 444 program. Love that. Yeah. We'll talk about that. That's really fantastic. Um, and now, does the data collection, because I know you, you have a great way of motivating people to stick with the program and to, to carry on, and you actually teach this to doctors, which we'll talk about, but does the data collection, have you found that helps you know keep people motivated yeah. and wanting to progress? Yeah, th no doubt about it. I mean, I do functional medicine, functional nutrition. I do blood work. I do vitamin mineral analysis. I do food sensitivity testing, and everyone gets an in-body. The in-body machine, the body comp, it really, it engages the client, it keeps them motivated, it's very important part of the conversation, and they're very interested to see their changes in their fat muscle ratio. So there's no doubt about it from a clinical standpoint, it keeps people compliant, and it is that data that people need to see. So as Dr. Tita once said on your program, the right program should do two things. It should improve their body composition, improve their blood chemistry. Right. And, and he also said something brilliant. The perfect diet is never, you know, found it's created. So when we're doing a program, we're creating that ideal program for them. We're giving them potentially a blueprint at that time, what they should be doing. And then we use the data, we use the chemistry, we use the blood work, we use the in-body, um, we use, you know, resting heart rate. We know we're checking all these, you know, hip to waist ratio. So we're going to be very specific on how you're improving and why and how we keep you getting better. Mm -hmm. And that's so much more accurate than the scale. A lot of people look at, at their wet body weight and they may see, you know, you may see, uh, you know, increases in muscle mass and loss in fat, uh, but your weight may stay the same. And that, so that's why, you know, using these yeah. more advanced biometrics are a lot better. Yeah. A scale is about as good as a, a, a screen door in a submarine. <laughs> right. Love so. it. I haven't heard that one in a while. Yeah. It's yeah. Good. So not that accurate. That's fantastic. Now, before we go into ketogenic, uh, ketogenic diets in a little bit more depth, I wanted to ask you as a chiropractor, you know, we recommend uh, doing squats and deadlifts and they're the two most, my favorite exercises. I, I feel like, you know, it really gets all the muscles going in your core. How hard are those on your spine? Yeah. So there's no doubt about it. I mean, when you put the bar on your back, you're compressing your spine, you're compressing your discs. You know, I'm, I'll be 51 soon. I've been squatting since I'm 12. That's a, seems like 38, 39 years. I still try to squat twice a month. Um, I used to pride myself on being able to put 315 on the bar up until about two years ago. I stopped about a year ago. Now I'll go as high as 250. But the bottom line is that, you know, I have a good spine. I have good discs from what I know. I still kind of feel a little bit, so I don't do as much squatting as I used to. I'll do more one-legged leg press. I rarely deadlift. So again, you got to have that core stability. You have to have good posture. You have to have good mechanics. And I'm not sure if most people have that. And again, it's that benefit risk ratio. Is the juice worth the squeeze? But is a squat a core movement we should be able to do? Is a lunge a core movement we should be able to do? Yes. But you may have to modify it. Do I do a full deep squat like I did when I was 25? No way, Jose. 
All right. But um, I think you got to fire those glutes. You got to fire those quads. But again, you have to be flexible. You have to good. You have to have good ankle range of motion. There's a lot of biomechanics that get into these lifts, and most of us at a certain age, quite frankly don't have the same biomechanics and flexibility. So you have to be real careful. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Now, why don't you deadlift? It's a good question. Um, Probably because I was never that good at it. (laughs) (laughs) Probably because I was never that good at it. Um, I would do the, was it the trap bar deadlifts? Mm -hmm. You know, I like those. I was working with a trainer. I did those. And I'll probably, you know, bring those up. I should probably do at least, you know, every year kind of have a certain time span. But it's a fantastic, it's a fantastic lift. Yeah. Okay. Keep in mind, I'm a washed up bodybuilder from Jersey. These muscles are really for show, Michael. I don't really have to use them. They're just for show. If you ask me to help you move your apartment or house, I'm going to say no. Okay. (laughs) These right. muscles are just for show. This is a bodybuilding mentality, New Jersey. Thank you very right. much. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. All right. So let's get into the ketogenic diets and, and maybe the nuts and bolts for people that want to do your, the Transformation 360 program. Uh, what are some of the most successful people doing and, and share with us some experiences? Yeah. So, you know, people know about the ketogenic program. You know, you just pretty much shut down the glucose and you have to, you're teaching your body to adapt to burning fat. And um, I'm not going to get too much of the science about that because people know or can look it up. But People who struggle, they have insulin resistance, they have that belly fat. It can be such a a, a linchpin for people to start burning fat who've been stuck. And I do a lot of good functional medicine, nutrition. I've actually had clients, I'm working with them, they're doing their two shakes a day, they're burning fat slow. I hook them up on a ketogenic program. Hey, they can lose four or five pounds in the first week. The average person loses 18 to 22 pounds in five weeks. If you're over 50, it's a little bit slower. We had one gentleman, he literally lost, I think he lost about 45 pounds in a nine week program. So it can be absolutely dramatic. And just as important as you're probably well aware, some people literally get euphoric. You can actually get euphoric. When your brain starts burning those ketones, I do. My staff knows I have high energy. When I'm in ketosis, I'm buzzing around here like a freaking ever read or ever bunny. I'm going crazy. I love that feeling. And you can literally feel every day that belly fat shrinking. It's fantastic. And my clients love it. It's not for everybody. But if you want to induce fat loss, you know, I tell my clients there's two real ways to induce fat loss. Either you do a modified elimination diet slash cleanse or a a ketogenic program. So we use the Transformation 360. I did not create that program. Um, Someone else did. I was at a a seminar by the IAACN. They did a sponsored lunch. It made real good sense. And you're using whole foods, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You're eating food and you're using these nutrition packs in between your meals that are protein, carbs, and nutrients. So you're not eating like junk food, like Jenny Craig food. We're teaching you how to eat high quality protein, olive oil, apple cider vinegar, and vegetables. So it's actually one of the best ways you can eat and it gets people on the right track for eating after their ketogenic program. Mm, I love that. Now, are you using uh, MCT oil or recommending people supplement with coconut oil or is it real food enough to get them into ketosis? Yeah, real food's enough. I mean, we do recommend at least um, 20 grams of olive oil a day. Um, when I do it next time, I'll probably use some MCT oil and I usually do spike with branch chains in between meals as well to help maintain my lean body mass. All right. I do lose a little lean body mass when I do the program, but with the branch chains in between, I typically do not. Um, and if I get hungry, I would probably, you could use the MCT oil on your vegetables, but, um, the olive oil sees, seems to do the trick. And I love the apple cider vinegar, olive oil. People just do absolutely fantastic with that program. And uh, the energy component, I couldn't imagine you on a, a ketogenic diet because you're already a you know, high-functioning, super energetic guy. So that must be a little wild. If you see him ketogenic, there's a big K in my cape in the front. Just get out of the way because I'll probably roll you over. I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> I love it. Now, yeah. what about your strength when you're on a ketogenic diet? Have you noticed anything? You know, it's interesting is I will do some lean body. I'll do some training, you know, with the ketogenic program, as you're well aware, you really shouldn't train that much. You know, we just recommend 30 minutes, three days a week, and we keep it mild to moderate because that can actually prevent ketosis. So when I do a ketogenic program, I pretty much do my keto walks. I stretch and do my walks. I'll do some interval training. I'll do a 60 second walk, maybe a 20 second burst. And I do notice when I'm doing the burst training, I burst better. I feel better. It's almost like, now, of course, you're losing weight. So when I lose three to four pounds, I can actually feel it when I run, if you want to call it running. But the bottom line is that when I do my bursts, it's it's, it's another level. It's a different octane fuel. 
it's a different octane fuel. And when I'm doing my heart rate, my heart rate is lower with the same out power output when I'm in ketosis, if you've ever noticed that. Love that. Yeah. You know, I don't wear a heart rate monitor. I do a heart rate variability, but I notice that when I'm in a, in a ketogenic state that my heart rate variability is improved. So it's actually yeah. higher. So it's the opposite. Yeah. Of yeah. that, which is the same thing, but uh, we just the last episode number 103, we had Alessandro Ferretti, he's a nutritionist and so forth in the UK, and he's done a lot of biometric testing and found the same thing that you just said, and, and on multiple clients, so heart rate is lower, so you know doing the same exercise, same intensity, and so forth, you can your body's more efficient yeah. at utilizing energy, which is really pretty profound. Quite frankly, I think those ketogenic diets will is the only thing that's going to really stop this obesity, diabetes epidemic, at least in our country. I mean, it's going to be hopefully more and more docs can utilize this in their clinics or just people in general because it's a fantastic tool that kind of works every time. Oh, that's great. So. Lovely information here. So anything about mindset or you know personal development or maybe yeah. visualization strategies that we didn't get to talk about? Well, well, I tell you, one of the things that's helped me the most, I have a private coach and, and, and we talk a lot. He's a business coach, private coach. He's a great guy. And um, it really comes down to, you know, getting people to do it, right? You know, getting people to be compliant, you know, your your discipline will determine your destiny. But how do you get people to stick to a program, whether it's yourself or I'm coaching a client? And and what we do is we really like to get to the big, powerful why. Like people come in, what's your goal? Lose fat. Why? You can ask the same question five times, but we call it, you know, you go down to the powerful why. You may have to ask them four or five, six or seven times to get to the main reason that they want to lose fat. And that could be improve the relationships in life, or it could be like an alpha male to leave a legacy. Because I'll say to a 55-year-old guy who's making tons of money with tons of belly fat, with high blood pressure on three medications, I'm like, is this the legacy you really want to leave? Is that you made all this money and provided this wonderful home for your, um, for your family, but you, know, you stroked that at 60? And you get their attention, and then you come up with this powerful why. And then I'll say something like this. What we need you to do, I'm asking you, Mr. Jones, to make five good decisions a day, and that's called food. Five good decisions a day. You make five good decisions a day, you can make two bad ones a week. Now, of those five decisions, two are going to be your nutrition shakes. you got to come up with three good decisions a day. And we'll tell them what to do. And here's what I like to do. I'll say to you, Mr. Jones, when you hit your goal, and you're losing fat, your energy is better, and your relationships are better, who are the five people who are going to benefit? They'll say, my wife, my three children, my coworker. I'll go, okay, good. Every time you make a good decision, you link it up to one of these people in your life who's going to benefit. So you're not just doing it for you, you're doing it for them. When you get to this powerful why and you kind of touch those nerves, it can sometimes elevate them a whole nother level of compliance and dedication, and that works a lot. So five good decisions a day, Give you two bad ones a week, but you're not just doing it for you. You're doing it for people in your world who you love, who are counting on you. And when you start with that language, my com the compliance goes through the roof. And sometimes there's tears that start shedding. So have tissues next to you. If your clinicians have the tissues there because they're going to start crying. Give them the Kleenex and then tell them when the leak stops, you know, let's get on with it and let's get your shakes. And let's get your food and get you going. That's powerful stuff. It made me pause for a minute and really think about that. So yeah. I'm sure our listeners are going to resonate with that. It, and, and Tony Robbins has kind of talked about this for a while is we want to link our goals with something much bigger than ourselves. And That's there's it. some great books out there. Uh, mm -hmm. Brendan Michard, Motivation Manifesto. Have you come across that yet? Yeah, I haven't. I got to read it's on the list. But yeah, I mean, we, we, it's. I'm sure it's the same language, but it's. It, it, this whole thing is bigger than us, right? This whole thing is bigger than us. But when our health is in jeopardy and we're overweight and we're pre-diabetics, we're just not effective. We're certainly not on purpose. Mm -hmm. And my patients, they, they realize that and they come to us. We don't, we want to change their lives, save their lives and actually, you know, have a big impact on that. I love that. I'll put that in the show notes again, everyone at highintensityhealth.com slash DR. So what would that be? A little wine on Friday, pizza? Yeah. I mean, what are these? <clears throat> I got to go back. Five good decisions a day, maybe two bad ones a week. And I call it the two, four, six rule. So you brought up wine. We have another rule. I think I made this up. Two cheat meals a week, four to six drinks a week. If you're a woman or a small man, maybe four drinks a week. That's probably what you can get away with from a insulin spike. Six if um, you know, you're a big guy, you're you know, used to drinking. But I'd like to see that alcohol four to five drinks a week as a general rule for fat loss, especially if there's blood sugar issues. So I call it the two, four, six rule. Two cheat meals a week, four to six drinks. 
Another consideration I call it the three by three, five by nine. By 3 p.m., you better have three clean meals, and by 9 p.m., five clean feedings. Teaching people you got to pulse your protein. So all these little pseudo bolelaisms we call them to keep them in there because there's too much to think about. You know, most weight loss programs are self-directed. They fail because people are overthinking it. Give them strategies, give them something to think about. And, you know, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but, you know, alcohol, yeah. Go out on a Friday night, have yourself gluten-free pizza, gluten if you can handle it. you got the wedding. And I tell you, don't have the cheat meals choose you. You choose them. Don't be your workstation. You, 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 the person there has bagels. You go, oh, cheat meal, I'm going to have a bagel. No, no, no. You plan it out. Go to a nice meal with your wife or your husband, right? Go to the wedding. Go do what you got to do, and then you splurge. You get in and get out, and I do recommend try to compress it to one hour. If you have a smorgasbord, you keep eating for four or five hours like a Gavon, as we say in Jersey, you're going to have an insulin spike that can last days. A one-hour compress you know, spike won't have that same effect on fat gain. Mm -hmm. So a, a cheat meal, not a cheat day. Is that what we're saying? Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. A cheat meal. Bill Phillips used to say a cheat day. Uh, -uh. Then you blow up like a tick for three days. <laughs> you ever have that day where you have a cheat day? You yeah. wake up Monday morning, you look in the mirror going, oh, I got away with it. I don't look so bad. Two days later, you look like a tick. My head blows up like a balloon. Yeah. It's terrible. <laughs> I know. It's funny. Yeah. When I travel, sometimes my wife and I will you know, drink a little bit more than we normally do and, and have chips and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, you, your, your face gets really puffy and bloated so it my jowls funny. expand my jowls expand yeah <laughs> that's amazing so i love how uh before we started talking about all the details of that which were really fantastic dr tom you, you mentioned leaving a legend with which i think is pretty powerful and you have a legends club that you're working on with uh, a good mutual friend of ours mike antonelli so yeah. um, before we go to final questions why don't we talk about your legends club and what that is so bottom line is that i want to personally my big mission is to end the pharmaceutical drug era in our lifetime. There are way too many people who are on lifestyle-induced medications. I think we can all agree on that, right? As good friend Dr. Rakowski says, we're 6% of the population consuming 56% of the pharmaceuticals. That's just not okay. I can only see so many patients a day or week, and I work real hard. My united mission is to, you know, coach and inspire other clinicians integrated, primarily chiropractors, nutritionists, acupuncturists, MDs, and teach them what I've learned over 26 years of practice. I have a very strong practice here um, with respect to how efficient we are. I've done tons and tons and tons of practice management programs. I spent well into six figures on practice ma management and private coaching. That has been the best investment I've ever made. I've distilled all of that down. It's called Legends Club. It's for clinicians who want to improve their productivity, their capacity, and their skill. In other words, some of the best nutritionists and uh, functional medicine docs out there, they're only seeing three, four, five, six, seven people a day. That's not, we're not going to make an impact on, on people's health or ending the drug or with that. And they don't have, maybe their staff isn't as trained as they should be. They don't know how to successfully market using social proof with their patients. They're not managing their time. So the four pillars are staff, marketing, money, time. I teach all four of those and I do it in webinar programs each two, every two weeks we do a pre-recorded webinar and I do a live strategy call on Sunday at seven o'clock going over that. We Q and A. It's been extremely popular, very successful. It's what I'm most proud of right now. Love that. So is there a website that people can learn more about it? Right now it's through drtombalella.com. There's a link for Legends Club. There's information on that. If anyone's listening, they can put their, you know, their information. We'll send you information on that. I'll even get you if there's clinicians who are interested, you get on a free webinar. You just listen to it, see if you like it. So drtombalella.com, Legends Club, it's right there. And um, you know, hopefully it reaches hundreds or thousands of doctors so we can we can change this obesity crisis and um you know, end the drug era like we ended the cigarette era, right? The drug era started in 1983 when they allowed them to advertise drugs on TV, okay, through commercials. It's kind of ridiculous. We can end this drug era and get people on natural medicine, lifestyle, exercise, and stuff that you're preaching. I want to acknowledge you for doing such a fantastic job with your program. You're, the people on there, uh, on your podcast are great. I'm honored to be here right now, and I want to thank you for that. Sure. My yeah. pleasure, Dr. Tom. This has yeah. been really informative. Yeah, man. Thank you.
I love it. That's yeah. fantastic. So we'll put that in the show notes so everyone can learn more about that. Uh, again, uh, highintensityhealth.com slash GR Tom. So Dr. Tom, you're doing a lot of different things. You're juggling a busy practice, doing all this coaching, working with high-end athletes. What's your morning routine? What do you do when you get up? Okay. Morning routine. I'm up at 530. Try not to wake the wife as I crawl out of bed. Go downstairs, get my purified water. I drink it. Not too cold. I drink it. Most days I'm putting apple cider vinegar in there. Okay. I go outside on the deck. The sun's out. Take a few breaths, get that sunshine into my uh, into my eyeballs. You know, try to wake me up a little bit, and um, you know, then I take my water, I take my green drink, and I take my fiber, and I mix it up, and I drink my greens and my fiber. Then I get my organic coffee. I put my I put my protein in there. I put my coconut oil in there. What else I put in there? That's it. Coconut oil and some coffee and some whey protein. Usually I drink my coffee as I open up my emails. You know, we got to get on those emails. We got to take care. We got, I like to leave the house in the morning with all the emails done that I can do as I'm doing my emails and waiting for my coffee. I'm doing my task list for the day. I always have a task list. I write it on paper. I'm old school. I do my task list, things I need to call, things I need to do. I'll put in there even exercise. I'll put in what I'm going to do that day for exercise. Who I need to call, I'm going to have a staff meeting that day. I'm going to outline what I'm going to hit at the staff meeting. So I'm doing my emails. I'm doing my goal sheet or task list sheet, okay? Um, twice a week, I then a little, little note for my daughter, seven and a half year old Sophia and my wife, you know, tell them I love them. Okay. And, you know, have a great day today at camp and, you know, try to tell Mandy, you know, right or I love her, especially if I've been obnoxious or, you know, too caught up in myself, self-absorbed. <laughs> Sometimes I have to write a little letter anyway. And then I go off to work and I start my day and I even do that task list. I try not to do this on Sunday. I'm trying not, I try to stay off the grid on Sunday, but I still do my task list. Yeah. That's great. You know, it's funny on the task list thing. I just want to kind of expand. I'm reading this book about habits right now and people that even though if you don't look at your task list later, I mean, so for people listening, like, oh my gosh, I don't want to write a task list because then I'm going to have to look at it. Even just writing the act of writing it down makes your whole life more efficient. It's one of these keystone habits. Just like incidentally making your bed in the morning. I didn't realize this, but there's research showing that people that make their bed are more efficient and clean and organized throughout the day. So a task list is one of them. Yeah. And it helps my brain. I have that one of those brains that's very active. Um, the night before I put my clothes out, I take my underwear out. I take my socks. Out. I don't want to leave anything. I just want to wake up and start doing, but the task list, and even sometimes I'll even write on my task list what I want to happen. Let's just say for, uh, it could be, and oftentimes just the universe, you just writing into the universe. Oftentimes I'll say, you know, call John Doe. He'll call me. Right. So there's something I think also special and powerful about writing these things and telling the universe what you want. Now, this different than I do three month goals with respect to my practice, um, my personal, my family and the community. That's different. But the point is, if you can do anything and you're right, successful people, they write it down, they focus on it and it helps things to manifest. Love it, Tom. Great yeah. info. It so works. let's talk about uh, an herb nutrient botanical or whole food substance that you just could not live without. This is something that you recommend to everyone. What is that? Yeah. So, you know, I know the question's coming because I listen to your podcast. I think it's great. I, I think I'm going to have to go with the B complex family. And here's why I do a lot of vitamin mineral testing and boy, people come back insufficient, functionally deficient in many of the B vitamins. And we know how important B vitamins are for releasing energy from food and many other factors. So I tell you, our society, you know, vitamin D is important. We all know this, but I'm going to go with the B-complex family. I know you want one vitamin, but I'm going B-complex. That's my final answer. I'm saying the B vitamins. <laughs> love, love that. Very passionate there, Dr. Tom. So if you were to bump shoulders with a senator, or governor, or maybe Barack Obama, or a future president, and just had 30, 60 seconds to bend their ear on some lifestyle or health tip, what would you want them to know? One thing like a, a senator, President Obama, someone who can make a difference, hopefully, I'm going to say something like this. We know that our health care is crisis, 78% of chronic disease, you know, lifestyle. We know it starts typically with obesity, diabetes, visceral fat. We know that once you start getting fat, you're at such high risk for problems. We know this. Let's say every doctor in the, in, in the society, every doctor in the country and school had a body comp analysis machine. You have an in-body or something similar. And this is actually attached to a database, maybe at the White House. And if you keep your, your, your percentage of body fat at the right place in a healthy range, not BMI, because we know BMI is not accurate, right? The average college football player who graduates has a BMI 34 because all the muscle, 
all right? I want to know your percentage of body fat. If you keep your body fat percent in a healthy range, you should get a reduction in your taxes. You should get a reduction in your insurance. You should be rewarded for being self-reliant and proactive with your health. And you could actually track this. You could actually do it in body. I mean, it's probably a HIPAA violation and it probably, who knows? But if you can prove that you're keeping your body in shape, you should be rewarded for that. And I think that would be the best thing I could tell a senator, President Obama, you know, the Surgeon General, let's track body fat, let's reward people for being lean. And that's my answer. I love it. Yeah, that I think financial motivation would really inspire a lot of people to make the right choice, because it's so easy to, you know, eat bad food. So if you could, you know, everyone is mo motivated by money. I mean, look at, you know, homeownership and mortgage interest, yeah. you get to deduct that. I mean, there's so many different things. So great advice. Dr. Yeah. Tom Belila, Really appreciate you coming on the show. You truly inspired me. I know you're inspiring other people. So you have a couple different websites. You want to plug your website so people can yeah. reach out to you? So, so drtombalella.com is a basic website. There's some good video libraries on there about myself, or not even so much, but a lot of my video testimonials for my clients. The Nutrition Treatment Center is being rebooted. Not sure when this is going to air. Within uh, probably by August 15th or sooner, 2015. The new website, nutritiontreatmentcenter.com is up. I think you're going to love it. A lot of good inspiration, testimonials, and how people can contact me. So nutritiontreatmentcenter.com, Dr. Tom Bellella, Legends Club. Really appreciate the time. This is the best part of my day, Michael. Thank you, sir. Have a good one. Thank you so much.